It's the DNP Project Podcast with your hosts, Dr. Molly Bradshaw and Dr. Tracy Vitale. Episode 2, the DNP Project Overview in a Nutshell. In this episode, we're talking about the overall idea of the DMP project in a nutshell, because this is the DMP project podcast where we share tips, inspiration, and more. So before we get too far into the podcast, we have to explain what a DMP project is and go through kind of the main idea of the project. So there's four fundamental points that we want to make in this episode. So the first thing is the DMP project starts with a problem. It does not start with the intervention. It starts with a problem. And then you have to, number two, examine what is known. Number three, you have to implement something and evaluate it. And number four, you have to share with other people what you know. So my name is Dr. Molly Bradshaw, and I'm the host of the podcast, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Tracy Vitale. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Molly. How are you today? Good. So today we're talking about the, the big picture of the DMP project, what it is, and we want to kind of just do the down and dirty in a nutshell overview. And... Um, that will set us up well to talk about different elements of the project as we get deeper into later episodes. So we're going to start off with the number one point is that a DMP project starts with a problem. It starts with a problem. Now there are rules from AACN about this. AACN, the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, says that the, the problem that we focus on, it has to have a direct or an indirect impact on patients and populations. So um, in your core courses in your DMP program, you're gonna take courses in things like informatics, in theory, in policy, in leadership, and these types of courses. And in these courses, you're gonna learn to um, get certain skills together. But really, um, from the get-go, we're always asking students about what their project is gonna be about and really what we're asking, what we should be asking is, what is the problem that we want to focus on and how does that problem impact our patients or population either directly or indirectly? So one of the opportunities in these early courses that you're taking um, is to examine this problem in a lot of different ways and through a lot of different lenses. So for example, if you're focused on um, diabetes in elderly females or whatever, um, in your informatics course, you would look at that problem through the lens of IT, health information technology. In your theory course, you might look at different theories that impact that patient, that population, that diagnosis, and so on and so forth. So you're trying to take these deep dives and look at this problem through every single angle that you possibly can to make sure that you fully understand what the problem is. Um, and so as you start to um, hone in on the problem you're going to work on, your DNP team, which is the people that are going to help you do the project, and so that consists usually of a faculty member or faculty members, maybe people from the organization that you're partnering with, to choose the problem for the DNP project, it has to be a match between the problem that you are passionate about as a student, and it also has to be a priority for the organization or the institute or the community partner that you're going to partner with to complete the project. So it's gotta be a mutually agreed upon uh, problem and priority. And sometimes you'll hear people talking about the gap, like what is the gap in practice? So another way to look at the problem of a project is to say, if there's maybe a clinical guideline that says when we're taking care of diabetes or diabetic patients, the standards of diabetes care from the ADA is a guideline and it's a, an outline of what we should be doing for diabetic patients. But when we examine the reality of our clinical practice, maybe we identify that X, Y, and Z is not getting done or it's not getting done well. And so there's a gap between 
what the guideline says we should be doing and what's actually happening in clinical practice. So identifying problems can be related to identifying gaps. And there's all kinds of rules out there. There's joint commission, there's CMS, there's, I mean, you can go on and on and on about standards of care, policy, protocols, clinical guidelines. So sometimes finding a problem that you wanna focus on is as simple as saying, look at these standards, these guidelines, and then on the other hand, look at the reality of clinical practice and where's the gap? What's happening or not happening and there's the problem or the process or the issue that you've got to work on. Um, so that's kind of where that first step in lies is finding the problem or the gap that is a priority for the student but also a priority for the partnering organization, institute, community, leaders, that type of thing. But probably Tracy if you're like me when I counsel DMP students they don't start off focusing on the problem. They start off focusing on the answer. They're focusing the on answer. the solution. Eh, eh, wrong, wrong, <laughs> wrong, wrong. Abort, abort, abort. As a student, you start off with the problem. Don't focus on the intervention. But you know, students will say, well, for my DMP project, I'm going to implement blah, 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 blah. And you always have to backtrack them and say, well, what's the problem? What, like, why are you doing this? So talk to us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I would totally agree that that is the, the most common conversation that I have with students as they're uh, developing their project ideas. Um, and it's not to say that it's a bad idea, um, but there's, there's a reason why you want to start with the problem. Um, First off, as you had mentioned, in terms of the, the organization relationship that you're going to have, your, your partnership that you're going to have with where the project is going to take place, it needs to be important to them. Uh, you'll learn in leadership courses that when you're speaking of trying to fix something, you need to build that bridge from the other side. Um, you can, it can be the most important issue in the world to you, but if it's not important to them, you face the challenges of potential roadblocks. Um, because if you think about your organization and, and maybe we're talking about an acute care facility that just had a visit from the Joint Commission and uh, infection rates uh, are through the roof and you're looking to implement um, uh, car seat safety because car seat safety is something that you care tremendously about and you work on a mother baby unit. Um, that might not be the priority for that organization if they're facing, um, you know, uh, uh, penalties from joint commission because of infection mm -hmm. rates. So it's really, it's really important. Think about your stakeholders. Uh, one of the things we talk about in our boot camps, which, which we mentioned in one of our previous episodes, is think about what's important for them, you know, for the people that you're talking to, the people that you're giving your elevator speech to. Um, they, they want to know what's in it for them. Why should they care about this issue? Um, and in order to get them to appreciate why they should care about it, you have to explain what the problem is. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't necessarily care about the how you're going to fix it. They want to know what the problem is and why is it mm -hmm. so important. So as a student, if I'm taking it to the next step, so I've got a problem, it's a priority for me, it's a priority for my partnering entity, how do I go about, um, and I've taken my core courses, so the next thing really is to examine what is known. So can you explain a little bit more what we mean by step number two, examine what is known about the problem? Sure, so what you want to be thinking about is what have others done to solve this problem? And is it something that could work for you? Um, you know, as part of our education for the students, you, we expect them to be able to have the skills and the ability to search the literature, um, more so than just going to Google and typing in hypertension. Um, mm -hmm. We want them to have a meaningful uh, approach uh, to finding and appraising the literature because mm -hmm. it's gonna help them drive towards evidence-based solutions. We're mm -hmm. not looking for students to reinvent the wheel. We're not looking for them to discover 
um, new methods, right? That's, you know, again, we've talked about that and the difference between PhD work in primary research versus DNP work of translating the evidence um, into practice, which is really what we are charged with. Um, so what, what is out there? Um, what processes have been shown to work that you can, you the student or the student that you're advising, can adopt into a, a local context in a setting near them to make this to make this impact. And I want to go out on a limb here and add to that and say, solutions do not have to be limited to healthcare. Uh, there is a, um, a a beautiful thing that can happen in taking process concepts from other disciplines and applying them to healthcare. Um, you know, we read sometimes a lot of it. There's a great book about, you know, the airline industry and uh, the safety practices that we have borrowed from um, the airline industry and the military even on how to put teams together, how to have safety, quality, yeah. things like that. So I would really push at the doctoral level that searching the literature and searching that, I mean, certainly look in the healthcare literature, but don't limit yourself to that. Be a very broad-minded and perhaps there is a solution out there uh, to come together. And another important point that I've heard too is there really are no such things as new ideas. It's putting old ideas together in new combinations. Mm. And that um, might be a way to think about bringing concepts over what is the combination of evidence-based solutions that fits best to your situation, your organization, and things like that. Yeah, I, I think that along those lines in terms of looking at the evidence and what's out there and what strategies have worked for others. Um, another component of understanding what is known about the topic or the issue or the, the practice site is also the understanding of what the needs are. What's the state of the organization? Um, needs so assessment, just, yep. Yeah, so just as much as it's important to know what the literature says, um, students need to have an appreciation for an organizational assessment or a needs assessment um, or an environmental scan to know what's really going, going on out there. Because, you know, something as simple as, you know, you're looking to do um, an asthma-related project. Um, if there's a hospital down the street that just opened up a brand new asthma clinic, um, that may pose um, a threat to your project in, in some capacity. So um, it's really important that students want, when they're examining what is known about an issue, that it's more than just what's in the literature. It's understanding that local impact um, or influencing factors as well. And in our workbook, we do some exercises with students about that. We even have one that we call cognitive walkthrough, where you're imagining, you know, as a patient that you're moving through a system. So there's a lot of different techniques for that, but that's a really good point. So if we have a problem, we've examined what is known, the next thing is we got to do something about it. So Absolutely. talk to us about that. Do you so have the, to implement something for a DMP project? Well, AACN says you do. Um, so the, the next step is implement and evaluate. So at this point, this is where you're going to use some uh, theories and frameworks to guide you um, in how you execute your project. Project design is going to come into play. Uh, but the bottom line is you are expected to have a plan, have it approved, do it, and evaluate it. Um, I think an important step when we, when we consider evaluation is that it should not only include the outcomes that you intended to measure, but also allow for some evaluation of the process. You know, sometimes it, it may have been a good plan, but a bad execution. And it's, it's the way that it was executed and uh, that needed some improvement. Um, and certainly a lot of the um, uh, implementation science theories and frameworks do speak to that uh, cyclical um, process of constantly evaluating and, and reconfiguring what that 
what that execution looks like. You know, sometimes it comes down to um, having to consider abandoning a certain process and looking to to do it a different way in the future and you know different methodology. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the take home here is you know, in the past, you know, there's been a lot of inconsistency of DMP projects. We hear this conversation all through the country. Um, and so what the AACN is trying to push, and we'll talk about their white paper a little bit later in another episode, however, but what we're really trying to push is that a DMP project is not just a recommendation. It's not just a, this would be good to do kind of thing. We are about evidence-based, we changing practice to help the outcomes for the people and populations we serve. So you have to take action, you have to do something and then evaluate if it helped or not and how the process went. But that's a really important point. You've got to do something, you can't just recommend something. All right, absolutely. And you know, all of these three steps that we've talked through already, um, you know, are, are all mutually exclusively important. However, we can't forget that we have to share it with others. That's true. Right. We, true. Uh, otherwise we spent a whole lot of time working on a project and then it just sits there. So, um, as, as students complete their projects, it's important for them to share with others what they've been able to find out. Uh, so those students listening out there, think about who you need to share your information with. Uh, for those faculty members that are listening, um, you, you have a different level of expertise. Where would you guide your students in um, distributing, uh, excuse me, disseminating their information? So usually some low hanging fruit that we expect all, all students to disseminate is on the academic side, they're writing a paper. They're likely conducting a presentation, maybe even a poster. Um, to disseminate their results of their project um, on a local basis to the, to the community members within their academic institution. They're likely also sharing it with the organizational stakeholders. Um, you know, it's, I think it's only appropriate that if you're conducting your project at an institution or maybe someplace out in the community that you share the results with, with those community members. Um, so uh, each of these deliveries is going to require some rearranging and maybe some uh, differing focus on results uh, to best meet the needs of, of the audience, um, but certainly an opportunity. I think, um, you know, Molly, you've got some great ideas for other ways outside of the immediate project stakeholders for um, how students can share uh, the results of their project. Well, and I would say that's a two part, uh, two part answer, you know, there is professional dissemination. So we would encourage students, you know, to identify a conference right um, into a peer reviewed journal, those type of things. So there's the uh, formal uh, um, scholarly, you know, professional type dissemination. But there is also um, the way we consume our information in this day and age, we consume lots of information through social media. We consume um, information through YouTube. People who are listening to this podcast are consuming information through a podcast. So when you think of infographics, listicles, um, webinars, um, Facebook live events, there are all of these things are what we would call ticklers. You know, so they are a concise, maybe shortened version to help engage or help grab somebody's attention. And then that can lead, if someone's interested, it can lead them to that more formal, scholarly based um, intervention. So I just encourage our community and especially faculty to not overlook the importance of disseminating information in this way because it is truly a skill set to be able to disseminate the same information in a multitude of different ways. So when you're writing it for a formal academic paper, that's different than when you're writing for a journal. That's different than when you're writing for a community newsletter. That's different than when you're writing to post a blog on social media. So having the ability and the skills to disseminate to the right audience 
in the way that that audience consumes information is important. And we have to think bigger, um, we have to think bigger than some of the traditional ways that we have always disseminated information. So that's just one of my pet peeves uh, about Absolutely. And sharing I think, with others. Yeah, and we're seeing more and more evidence um, and support of those, what we would probably call non-traditional uh, methods of dissemination um, come to light and an increased focus on them. You know, I've, I've recently been involved in a couple of different um, webinars where there's, you know, very early shifting in thinking about, you know, when you think of faculty members and their requirements for scholarly work and publications and presentations uh, for consideration for reappointment and promotion. Um, I think that we've got some administrations out there that are recognizing that there's just as much impact and, and maybe potentially more, more. reach um, mm -hmm. for dissemination via blogs mm -hmm. and, and social mm -hmm. media um, mm -hmm. based on the analytics that are mm -hmm. available. And remember the key is to tickle and grab interest and then lead an audience to where they can learn more or get additional information. Right. Um, so back to just to summarize again for our DMP project, the bottom line is find a problem, examine what is known, implement and evaluate and share what you find. But let's talk about who gets to set the rules for the DMP project because the AACN has some recommendations and guidelines for what should go into the project. And I think we're going to talk about that in the next episode, those minimum expectations. But at the end of the day, it is truly the university that gets to decide what goes into a DMP project. Um, so talk to us, are all DMP projects quality improvement? Um, not at all, not at all. Um, I think some folks, again, depending on where you're at, some folks will say QI projects really, you know, I did that as an undergrad. You know, is that really what a DNP project uh, um, is supposed to be? Um, I think we have to, I think there's an opportunity for quality improvement to be a DNP project, but we want to make sure that it is at the doctoral level and that it's including that evidence-based practice and allowing mm -hmm. students to really um, uh, integrate the use of um, uh, theoretical frameworks, conceptual frameworks, mm -hmm. and higher level thinking. Mm -hmm. Bernadette Melnick talks a lot about the idea that there's quality improvement on one spectrum and there's evidence-based practice on the other, but to combine the two, quality improvement with evidence-based practice, is really more where um, we want to sit in, in terms of that. So that's um, absolutely. How would you answer the question, is the DNP project research? Oh, it is not technically research, although it might be, and it might, uh, it definitely involves research concepts. So, you know, when you are recruiting people to participate in your DNP project, you may use the same strategies that another PhD student would use to recruit people to their study. There's a recruitment flyer. There is inclusion exclusion criteria. There, um, you know, it, it's very similar. And even when we analyze our outcomes, we are maybe using descriptive statistics. Sometimes we might be using inferential statistics. We may or may not, but, but there is definitely an overlap and a borrowed, but I think here's the distinction the purpose is different. So when somebody's doing a, a true, purely research project, the intent is different. Because again, remember, it's meant to be more generalizable, more precise, more um, rigorous, that type of thing. We are a practice-focused degree. Practice is dirty. It's messy. It's um, honorary, we would say in Kentucky, if that's a word, but um, it's, it's different. So our intent of the project is different. It's a little bit more rapid cycle. Again, it's in that local context. Mm -hmm. So I would say, no, it's not really research. It borrows concepts from research, but it is different 
then the traditional, um, the intent is different. So now here's the caveat to that. I've had a DMP student before that had a PhD. I mean, she had a PhD. She was already PhD prepared. So in the context of her DMP project, she did do, I would say, a little bit more sophisticated data collection and sophisticated um, analysis, but she had a skill set to do that. But at the end of the day, her DMP project was still about utilizing evidence in a local context to make a change in practice and evaluate the outcome. So the intent of her DMP project was different than the intent of what she did for her dissertation. So I hope that makes sense. Sure, sure. What would you say about can a student do a systematic review or an integrative review as a DMP project? So um, I, I think that we've got some clear guidelines from the AACN that a systematic review alone um, is, is not an appropriate DMP project. And I think that if you ask yourself the simple question, does this action change practice or have the potential to change practice? Then meaning completion of the Meaning system. completion of it. Um, would that count as a DMP project? Doing a systematic review alone is not going to change anybody's practice, right? Mm -hmm. Um, neither is an integrative review. Quite honestly, neither is a retrospective chart review. None of that is changing practice. But if you do that as part of a larger project that includes an implementation and evaluation, then I think it certainly can. Um, you could. It's that implementation and evaluation that's missing, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's the that's the AACN's argument about absolutely. It. Um, because what are you going to do with that information? We can, mm -hmm. you know, systematic reviews are, are an important part of the process in, in mm -hmm. changing practice. Um, but if, if the goal is to change practice, we want students to be able to do something with that information. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the development of um, a, a business plan for an organization based on the results of the systematic review. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's the development, you know, I think we've got some, the, some possibilities to set up uh, what, what we have called legacy projects. And I know we, we plan on talking about that in some future podcasts about how do you take this work, be able to check off the boxes of what AACN expects out of a DMP project, um, but allow for another student to come behind and take those results and build upon it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm thinking of a systematic review that students were involved in where they looked at compassion fatigue in nurses. Um, they conducted that systematic review, spent a lot of time working on it, based on that developed recommendations for an organization to implement a compassion fatigue program to help with mm -hmm. retention of nurses, the well-being of nurses, um, and they were able to have some level of organizational um, evaluation. They, they, mm -hmm. they developed their plan, that was their implementation. They had some high level administrators evaluate it. They collected that information, analyzed it, reported back. Um, and as a result of that, we've got other students that are um, using that information and, and creating future projects. Mm -hmm. So. And what about the concept of portfolio? Uh, you know, I, I know initially we were going through a phase because the first DMP programs were surfacing about 2005. We definitely went through a phase of should we do a portfolio, meaning take pieces maybe from different classes, put it together in the context of a portfolio. But in general, that concept, it's not um, totally faded away but it, it is not as popular as it was at one time. Is that your experience? It is, it is. And I think that um, with the current um, essentials being under revision, um, I think we'll see some more information about this coming down the pike. I think that um, 
in terms of the portfolio, I can certainly appreciate how um, it's a, it allows students to take bits and pieces from courses and allow it to work for them. But I think an important skill set that we want students to have is the ability to put it all together and be able to execute a, a project from beginning to end using all of those skill sets. So do I think there's a place for it? Sure, maybe, that's my personal opinion, but I, I, would, I would hope that we would still have an opportunity for students to say, okay, here, here is what I've done, here are the skill sets that I have evidence of, of being able to achieve, but now here is a cumulative product of mm -hmm. me being able to do that. I think it will allow the students to really see that true impact on outcomes by being mm -hmm. able to have mm -hmm. a summative product. Just to kind of, you know, start to bring this conversation to a close a little bit, you know, bottom line, the, the decision of the nature and composition of a DMP project is up to the school. So students listening, you have got to go back and review your own school's requirements for the DMP project because it's not one size fits all. Um, we do need flexibility built into projects because the needs in one place are not the same as needs in the others. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic really is starting to highlight this, that we are gonna see a shift. And Tracy, I know you and I are always saying, the DMP project is a living process because practice is living. It's a, it's a morphing thing. Project, projects and problems of today will not be the same five years from now or 10 years from now or 20 years from now. So as faculty, I think we've got to be very, very careful about pigeonholing ourselves into a project has to be this or it has to be that. I like the bigger idea of the bottom line, what do I want a student to be able to do? I want them to know how to find problems that are meaningful and relevant in clinical practice. I want them to be, ha be able to examine what is known. I want them to do something about it and I want them to evaluate if it helped or not and if the process worked or not and to share with others what they know. If my student can do those four things at the end of the day, then I'll be happy as a DMP educator. So. Absolutely. And I, I don't know, um, that sounds simple, but it sounds, that's really, it sounds, sounds right? kind of simple, but that's, <laughs> that's what we're trying to do, so. Yeah. And, and we've, got some, uh, we've got some examples that we've talked about uh, in our workbook um, that'll help students throughout their journey. So uh, check out our, our available workbook on Springer Publishing. Uh, hopefully students will be able to help get themselves on track in starting this project from the beginning with identifying what and that And that's the is. DMP project workbook, a step-by-step -step process for success. Do you want to hold that up so people can see that? Oh yeah. If you're on the YouTube video or if you're on the YouTube channel, there you go. That's uh, the cover. That's the one you want to get. So. All right. So Molly, what's coming up in our next episode? In the next episode, we are going to talk about the minimum expectations of a DMP project as outlined by AACN. So we've given you the big picture here of the project, and we're going to next give you what um, the AACN says specifically about these. So join us in the next episode. That's great. And if you're looking to find us, check us out on Twitter at DNP Success, also on Instagram at DNP Success. Um, you can reach out to us via G, uh, our email address, DNP Success at gmail.com. Uh, check us out on our YouTube channel, search for DNP Success and subscribe. And if you like our episodes, share it, like it, send some comments, let us know how we can continue uh, to support you and get you information that, that you're looking for. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. You've been listening to Dr. Molly Bradshaw and Dr. Tracy Vitale on the DNP Project Podcast. Check out the DMP Project YouTube channel at DNP Success on YouTube.